Hello, everyone. Welcome to this edition of Off the Cuff with Chris Martinson. I am your host today, as always. And today we're going to be discussing economic matters, education around economic matters and finance. Why? Because you need to understand what's happening in order to position yourself properly and get ready for what's coming today. We have a really special guest. I'm so excited to finally be talking in this venue with Michael Guyad. Michael, welcome to the program. Uh, I, I appreciate being on the other side of it this time around. So thanks for the invite. Absolutely. So I really uh, appreciate what you do on Twitter. I've been following you there for a while. That's um, at lead lag report on Twitter. You've got what three quarters of a million followers there. You do just a great job. And um, it, it's been fabulous learning from you. So here, here's the here's the premise of today's program. I think that there's some obvious uh, disconnects out there, whether it's the fiscal position of the United States government, whether it's you know, when is the Fed going to pivot and start printing again? Um, you know, what do we do with these outrageous levels of mortgage debt, credit card debt, auto debt that we're seeing on the consumer side? There's a lot of things to detangle. I want people to know about this because I'm worried, Michael, that that people are going to get hurt in this next downturn, which is going to have the same seeds of its own destruction as the last downturn, which is, oops, we kind of overdid it in a number of dimensions. That's my theory. Um, and so I just wanted to you know, parse that with you, but mostly I want to help people decode what I think is an unnecessarily complex landscape of finance and, and help them understand this so they can make better decisions. That term, um, justifiably scared, I think is an interesting way to think about what's going on here. Because the reality is there are a lot of disconnects and divergences, just as you alluded to, right? And mm -hmm. so even today, as we're recording it um, in, in early August, right? I just put out this post on X basically saying, okay, so the argument the last month and a half was what? Market breadth is improving. So I just looked at the percentage of stocks in the NASDAQ composite that are trading above their respective 200-day moving average. And that number is falling. It didn't even reach the prior peak at the end of January of this year. So speaking about divergences, you've got everyone bulled up. And you've got in internal dynamics with the stock market that actually are massive, massive red flag. Now, um, you and I both know that the negative narrative is powerful. People do tend to gravitate towards a more negative outlook. Negativity does sound smarter. The bear case always does sound smarter. But that doesn't mean that it's wrong. Okay. And when, as I keep saying, the tinder is dry, when the conditions favor an accident, that doesn't mean you panic. It just means you adjust. You slow down. So I, I'm a big fan of, of how um, movies sometimes frame things for us. So Wolf of Wall Street gives us one framing. I'm thinking now of the big short. So so yeah. really important in markets is, um, you know, being right is not as it doesn't matter. <laughs> you you got to be on the right side of what that story is. So I, I was just shocked. I'm sure you saw this as well. Just yesterday, I saw that we work bonds are now at 90 percent yield. And so that means the price of them is just cratered. Of course, it should, because it's a. Uh, it's a bad model, right? We're going to lease buildings and then release them to people who are going to want to work in office buildings at a higher premium. And we're going to put this all in leverage. Obviously, that was destined to go bad. So if you had saw their early bond prices in early 2020 up through March, those things spiked up to 20% yield. And you're like, oh, I got to short these things. Well, you were wrong until mm, mid-2022, right? All of 2021, when their entire business model should have been cratering, should have should it didn't right so i'm thinking back to the big short you know you can be right but wrong that's a part of the markets often isn't it yeah and you know i i, I say that line ad nauseum that path matters more than prediction right so we often talk and think in terms of endpoints and different scenarios but how you get to the end point is really all that matters and as you know um this is the only domain in life where you can be wrong and make money or write and lose money. Mm -hmm. right? And and if there's anything that anybody that's experienced in markets, you know, can say with confidence, it's that conditions change, that cycles change, that some cycles don't favor a certain approach, a certain mentality, other cycles do. You don't know when the cycles changed until two to three years after the cycles changed. So all those people on that WeWork example uh, that might've been shorting, thinking that it would go bust, they were right. But to your point, the when is what matters, right? The path is what matters. And that's always the difficult part in this in this game. I think a lot of people 
they tend to beat their chest about getting something right that's happening on the macro front. But that doesn't matter from a from a portfolio management perspective, from an execution perspective. Um, I, I wish more people would appreciate that there's a big difference, right? And most people live in the portfolio of the now, not of the endpoint of the later. Mm-hmm. So as you scan the landscape right now, what is top of mind for you in terms of the the big things people should be looking at is it is it the amount of debt is it um is it the price action what where, where are you actually focusing right now so i am legitimately blown away and i'm not trying to be overly dramatic when i say this mm-hmm. i am legitimately b- blown away that all of these uh, big banks have suddenly pulled away their recession calls just as the fastest rate hike cycle in history starts to only impact the economy now. Okay, so this is really, I think, where everybody gets market dynamics largely wrong, okay? And it's hard to kind of wrap your head around, especially when there's such a focus around short-termism and this kind of uh, instant gratification type of mentality that investors and traders have. These things act with a lag. Monetary policy, fiscal policy acts with a lag. The Mm -hmm. lag for monetary policy is usually nine to 12 months out which is around now, right? The yield curve is still screaming recession. Small caps, I would argue, are actually also screaming recession. Now, why am I saying that? Because there's no new bull market in small caps. The vast majority of things which are tied to the domestic consumer have not really performed well, certainly after inflation this year in what is supposed to be a really good year because of pre-election year dynamics that favors all stocks. You're in this, uh, no, here's a good good example of that point about divergence. There's that old saying that a rising tide lifts all boats. That hasn't happened this year, like at all, right? And everybody's getting sucked into, because of the availability heuristic and home bias, they're thinking the market is the S&P, the market is the NASDAQ, the market is the Dow. Those are not markets. Those are, those are strategies that are cap-weighted that favor momentum in very large names. That's not the vast majority of what's really happening beneath the surface. So we're at a point in the year now where I'd argue everybody's on the same side of the boat and holding an anvil. And I say that very purposely because when you look at st- the margin levels relative to free cash, there's a lot of leverage by traders. You looked at, at the name active equity exposure index. Active managers are the most exposed to equities since November of 2021, which is when the bull market ended for large caps. You've got, with respect to a lot of the newer traders, a lot of what I call uneducated speculators, playing with leveraged weapons of financial destruction with options, Mm -hmm. derivatives, okay, where the the tail wags the dog. And you've got, uh, again, from a seized downy perspective, a juncture where Usually, the volatility side of equity tends to rise from August to October. So I I keep posting out, no one is prepared. Not because I'm trying to be overly dramatic, but because the data actually shows that. Right there, there is this sort of feeling that we're in a real bull market. Nothing's going to stop this. Uh, We're all going to make easy money. But again, somehow people forgot about this lag effect. Right. So I think there's a very interesting high risk period that we're in now. My, my thesis all along at the start of the year, which I was very loud on, was pre-election year, melt-up dynamics, but at some point there's a credit event because of the lags, because of those delays. You get the Fitch downgrade of U.S. government debt. You get uh, the very real possibility that Japan becomes a source of pain because of the reversal of the carrier trade, which we can talk about, because mm-hmm. they're dealing with very serious inflation. You've got these downgrades of banks, and everyone's like, oh, that's all, all this is nothing. Each one of those individually is a big freaking deal. But they're happening back to back to back. And that right. happens because of lags. That's my point. So, you know, being contrarian um, is not about just going against the crowd, right? It's about mm-hmm. where is the expected value highest, the probability times the payout. So if everybody's betting on the bull argument, they could all be right, but the payouts to be less than those that might bet on the bear argument because fewer other people are betting on that pot, even if that pot is lower the probability might be higher. Well, I've been absolutely uh, so many great points in there. I want to talk about the speculative side of this. I've been astonished by 
the size of the options market when you particularly when you get to these quadruple witching days when all the options sort of come together i'm like wow this is a huge percentage piece of this market now can you help people understand what that means because i know that's a lot of jargon i just sort of flopped out there but what what is a what 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 does it mean when options are all expiring on a given day at, at the sizes we're seeing now it, a, it, means, it means increasingly the money is not investing it's gambling right I mean, that's really what it is at the core it's 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 <laughs> it's amazing to me the 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 studies unequivocally show day trading doesn't work period end of story i don't care how good somebody claims to be this is fact. Now you're going to lever that with zero DTE, zero days to expiration options where people are day trading and making basically speculative bets on noise. Like this is insanity. Now I will say, and there's a lot of the reasons why I still believe we're in a bear market, but this is one of them. Bear markets are supposed to wipe this type of mentality out, at least for a moment in time. You have mm -hmm. to break the uneducated speculation the levered players who are getting into the market because they're simply gambling as opposed to doing real analysis on a company. You haven't had that flush despite last year. Right? Another reason, and that's, that's something you can't back test. That's just kind of my own sense of things that having been in the business a long time and seeing it from a cycle perspective and studied all things from the old uh, tomes when it comes to technical analysis to the more recent studies on behavioral finance, it's like this, bear markets tend to end by by wiping out a generation of foolhardy speculators. I still think we're in the bear market. That's one of the reasons. I would agree with that. But, you know, people, I think, rightly would say, eh, you know what? The Fed has shown that it has zero tolerance for downturns and they're going to ride in. They're going to rescue this. So uh, the, yeah. the winning bet was to bet that the Fed was going to ride in and rescue all of this stuff. Right. And. That would have been the right bet in September of 2019 because there was a little hiccup in the overnight, you know, repo markets. That would have been the absolute correct bet when they started doing what they did in the context of COVID, uh, et cetera. So, so isn't it? I, to, but to me, that's pure speculation. That that is people saying, "Listen, I don't really care about what's happening fundamentally with any of this stuff, debt levels, earnings streams, leverage. What I care about is when's the Fed going to start, you know, easing again." Now. I'd love to get your perspective on this, because when I peer at the chart that shows the relationship between Fed cuts and yep. stock market behavior, you find that it's only after the Fed starts cutting that the stock market really begins to tank in earnest. In fact, you know, beware the cuts, not, you know, let's um, be excited that they might be coming sooner. Right, because the, the Fed is reactive. The Fed doesn't know their mm -hmm. own, they own it's, it's, they, even they don't understand the lags from what they do. I just, it's funny we're having this conversation. I just earlier today posted, uh, I have this project where I, I use a program to basically go through, you know, old photos, right, on my computer uh, to help me kind of categorize mm -hmm. things. So it's it's using an algorithm to determine pictures that have faces. And one of the pictures that I just happened to come across today in doing that weekly project was a, a picture, I literally took it from my phone when I saw it in 2021 of Powell doing a press conference. And the headline on that picture from Powell back then was Powell basically saying, we, we think inflation expectations will take time to rise. This was March, 2021. After they just jammed the economy with all the stimulus, they didn't even understand the lags. And I, I, I put that out, not as a criticism necessarily around Powell, because the Fed has the same problem we all do. Nobody knows what tomorrow brings, mm -hmm. right? I mean, nobody can tell the future. I don't, I don't care how smart you were. I don't care how many PhDs you have. No amount of intelligence can increase the clarity of one's crystal ball. But True. if time and time again, you see examples where central bankers, policymakers, very intelligent people, who, by the way, were betting on WeWork, where time and time again, they get things wrong because they assume they know what tomorrow brings. And they assume they know what tomorrow brings because everyone else also assumes the same thing. You're really going to bet now that we're going to have a soft landing? You're really going to bet now that Powell threaded the needle? It's just like I, I, I'm blown away how people just don't even look to most the most recent history and, and, and think about the context of what happened back then as a reminder that things can play out in a very, very different way than people think. Yeah, well, my, my education on this was expensive, but I, I wrote it out to success at the end. I started shorting housing bubble stocks, mostly mortgage insurers and direct house housing companies, toll, you know, et cetera. And I was doing that through 2007. Man, that was painful. Um, 
you know, but I was just ahead of the curve a little bit. But at the same time, I was fighting the Fed who were putting out position papers by PhD saying there is no housing bubble. I'm like, of course there is. Right. Um, and, and so that's where I learned that that all the PhDs in the world, like like they were flying blinder than I was because I was just over here going, why is that hair salon owner got 19 houses right now? This doesn't make sense to me. You know, um, so so I would invite people like there's things cannot make sense for a while, but fundamentally. I believe I'm, <clears throat> I'm a Graham and Dodd guy at the at heart, right? Yeah. Fundamentals matter. They don't matter for periods of time. I think we're in one of those periods of time, but they will matter again. Where do you fall on that view? Oh, I, I think, well, they certainly should matter more when you're not at the zero bound, right? I mean, I think of, of interest rates, right? So I think that's, that is correct. And it's like, I thought that you weren't supposed to have P expansion in a rising rate environment. Funny how that narrative also just totally went away, right? In the yeah. way that things played out here. Um, but look, it, it is true on the fundamental side, right? That, uh, yeah, the market is overvalued. It's also true that the last decade has been, even slightly more than a decade, has been one of tremendous distortion. Okay, so speaking about path, right? Going back to path versus prediction. Mm -hmm. Prior to zero interest rate policy, prior to QE3, quantitative easing three, if you wanted to take a bet on US markets with leverage, without using leverage, how would you do that? You do it by going into emerging markets. Like I, I remember this very well because I launched my mutual fund ATAX in 2012. That's why I made that in that fund, emerging markets, a key part of the risk on side. Here comes QE, here comes ZERP. And suddenly emerging markets are not acting like the S&P. Suddenly all the money that's being printed actually, oddly enough, causes the dollar to rise because of this unfair advantage, cutting off the left tail risk the major risk for U.S. equities because you had that put by central bank, by the Fed. Mm -hmm. Conditions change, cycles change, right? There is a, a tremendous distortion in terms of large cap U.S. dominance against everything else in the world, which really hasn't done anything. So if you're going to say to yourself, okay, where do I want to invest? And you want to be worried about valuation. It's very clear where the overvaluation is. It's in the thing which everyone's crowded into. And the thing is, global diversif diversification has been terrible because you've lagged the S&P because it's been the only game in town. So how could that not be the most overvalued part of the marketplace? It has to be. So I want to talk about this diversification for a second, because and I ask everybody this who, who seems to know about markets, because this drives me nuts, just nuts. Um, so today, August 10th, the CPI comes out this morning, right? And I always go to my uh, Finviz. I look at my future screener and I pull up all the indices for the world. And on there, I've got, you know, all the US, we've got large cap, we got industrials, we got small caps, we've got tech. Then we got the German market on there, the Nikkei, we've got the Eurostox 50, et cetera, right? So they're all on there. And every single one of these on a five minute chart tracks each other wiggle for wiggle. Yeah. These markets could be closed, they could be open, they could be small caps, it doesn't matter. Everybody traded because, oh, US CPI tracked in at 3.2 instead of an expected 3.3. Haha. -ha. Um, can you explain to me why all these markets now move in almost pure coordinated synchrony, even though they shouldn't, <laughs> from my mind? But there's yeah, that I mean, should word. The, the <laughs> simplest answer is the right. By the way, it's funny that it's reacting off of an, a lag data point, which often gets revised. I mean, that's also a whole other amazing dynamic of the way people think about it these news pieces, but um, they'll move the same because it's all one big leverage trade. I mean, that's the reality. It's all one big leverage trade, which is why I keep right. using that term. I think we're very close to another one of these global margin calls. So, okay, there, there's, there's the liquidity leverage aspect of it, which causes co-movement to be tighter. There's the ETF aspect of it, okay, which I do think that structurally, as more and more money has gone into exchange traded funds, there's more co-movement. So it's not less about stock picking, more about just the right asset class. Oh, you can argue it's always been like that, but it got accentuated, right? Really in the mm -hmm. last decade. Um, I also think that you end up having this really strange dynamic where people are not appreciating what true diversification is. So they think that if you have uh, the NASDAQ and, uh, you know, uh, and some some other tech proxy because of the sheer number of securities in a portfolio that those funds represent, that's diversification. The reality is most things are risk on assets. Most things benefit from low vol regimes where there tends to be increased risk seeking behavior and then higher prices. There aren't that many true diversifiers, right? Historically, the best diversifiers are those, those areas of the marketplace 
that benefit from volatility rising, from doubt rising in the economy, in the markets. Those tend to be long duration treasuries, failed last year, which I said was my hell with my funds, which are rules based because they were in treasuries the bulk of last year. Uh, the dollar, which was the, was the clear winner last year. Gold is unequivocally a diversifier from a correlation perspective. And then on a relative basis, the utility sector, which tends to be the lowest weighted sector of most major averages. For the most part, if you have anything else but that, you're not adding anything to your portfolio from a diversification risk management perspective. I think this is really missed by mm -hmm. people. And there's another interesting dynamic here, which is that I always say that you cannot possibly be diversified unless you have a portion of your portfolio that you hate. Hmm. Right? So. Now, why do I say that? It's like, what are you going to hate? You're going to hate the stuff that's not working. But if it's not working, it means it's diversifying. Mm -hmm. Right? So you, there's this other dynamic, I think, where just because people can see their portfolios real time, they're inherently causing their own risk tolerance to be uh, fooled by what looks like multiple securities, but they're just trimming all the things which are red and they only want the things which are green, causing concentration risk, ultimately. So let's talk about, um, you know, as we as we cast forward, it's, Jerome Powell, for the first time in a long time, seems clear to me. He seems to be saying, listen, I'm going to keep raising rates till something breaks, right? And obviously, there's all this patter about, oh, it'll be a soft landing break. Leave that right. aside. When he's saying, I'm going to keep raising this till something breaks, what, what is he looking for? What, what breaks would catch his attention? It, it goes to how you started the prior question, which is what causes them to pivot. An event, a credit event. The Fed mm -hmm. does not care so much about the S&P 500 or equities. What they care about is a volatility spike in equities. Now, why is that? Because a volatility spike in equities coincides almost perfectly to credit spreads widening. So historically, you're, when you're in a healthy environment for the economy, the differential between very leveraged company debt issuances, junk debt, relative to AAA tends to stay in a tight range. And that's because there's a perception that, yes, even though a company may have a lot of leverage and a lot of debt, they're less likely to go default, to go bankrupt, because the economy is growing, the economy is strong, liquidity is there. Okay, the moment the VIX spikes, suddenly there's doubt about the economy, because the market's a discounting mechanism of the future. Default risk rises, or at least the perception of default risk, suddenly investors start saying, you know what, that WeWork bond uh, now may not survive, so i got to get more yield for it. i got to get compensated for the risk that I don't get paid at all. Right. And then if that happens at scale in the economy, in, across the entire bond market, that's when the Fed then tends to respond. So the breaking is credit spreads. It's not equities. Right. It's the it's the blowing out right now. This goes back to the point about the Fed being reactive. They will only start to step in to liquefy if the spreads really widen in a very fast, disruptive and aggressive way. The last year and a half you've had this really fascinating dynamic, fastest rate hike cycle in history, yet credit spreads have stayed tight, which is why the Fed has kept on hiking rates. Because the internally in the bond market, there is not a concern just yet that you could have increased default risk perception, increased bankruptcy risk perception in the bond market until the bond market starts to suddenly realize that all these highly levered companies are going to have to roll over their debt into higher rates. Now, it is true, there are a lot of so-called zombie companies, companies that cannot afford what would likely be the higher interest expense as they roll over their existing debt. If the if rates were to stay elevated, I, I'm pretty certain that that at some point starts to bother the bond market. Suddenly, investors start saying, you know what? I need to get more yield for the risk that on this rollover, on this refinancing, this company may not make it. And once you have that, then it's game on for the bears. Now, which credit spreads do you think the Fed is looking at most closely? Typically, it's the option adjusted OAS type of spreads. So uh, you can even pull it up on the on the FRED uh, database. You'll get OAS option adjusted spreads relative to the VIX. You see that one for one relationship. So I'm sure it's it's another and it's another tell for liquidity. Now here's another interesting dynamic. Um, I found this chart from Bloomberg that you know went viral when I put it out. It showed uh, bankruptcy filings rising 
okay, and overlay bankruptcy filings historically against credit spreads. So usually when bankruptcy filings are rising in the real economy, credit spreads widen. Bankruptcy filings means companies are going to default, they're going bankrupt. So you would think that that would at some point also be a similar message internally in the public bond market with junk debt. You have this huge divergence right now that's never seen before, been seen before, between bankruptcy filings rising in the real economy and credit spreads staying very tight, meaning they're not acting coincident, not acting the same way. So there's one of two ways to interpret that. Either bankruptcy filings are going to fall down. Well, good luck. Okay, with that. Or you're going to have an event where there's a sudden resync to what's going on from the bankruptcy, bankruptcy filings and that sentiment of default risk increasing. So I know all this sounds complicated, but it's very simple, right? The entire system has been predicated on low rates, QE, with, I'd argue, more than just the GFC. I'd argue all this started with the Iraq war, which is a whole other discussion, right? As far as just providing cover to print ad nauseum. You got a generation of people that have been used to the Fed stepping in and getting it in quotes right with hindsight, when in reality, they were just following price. You have the fastest rate hike cycle in history. And now you have seemingly everybody bullish. Again, maybe the crowd is right, but I tend to think that the crowd is only right on average, but very wrong at the extreme. I think we are at an extreme right now. And if I'm right on that, then you have to unequivocally watch how junk debt behaves, because that is going to be the real tell that the bear market's not over. I have a... a, a framing philosophy i call from the outside in like you never watch your triple a's you, you watch your triple c's you right. you watch what happens to greece before you figure out what's going on uh, in germany right you know it's, that's where the weakness progresses in but um you just said something that really uh, caught my attention which was you think that this cover to print started with the iraq war which one and can you can you flush that out for me that's that's fascinating so brown university had put out a study that they calculated that over the the 20 years of the Iraq war, right? The second one that, uh, aside from the lives lost, which obviously is horrible, the total cost of war was like $8 trillion. That number sounds familiar. It's the fed balance sheet. Mm -hmm. Now war has a funny way of getting, uh, policymakers to take on more power than they should. Right. And it causes money printing. Mm -hmm. Historically, it's even more than that, though, because the Iraq war also created, I think, this kind of culture of let big daddy government handle things and let's just keep spending. And I always reference that there was a there was a speech that George Bush uh, had had said where it basically said, listen, we're going to we're going to take care of this terrorism thing. Just go out and spend. There was no collective sense of we have to try to do this as a country. The army will take care of it. The United States government will take care of it. There was an abdication of responsibility entirely, which then resulted in them, in them I'd arguing, uh, I'd argue, basically it lays the groundwork for liquidity. It laid the groundwork for the GFC. It laid the groundwork for inflation today, because they just kept on printing in order to subsidize the war effort. So this is I can't prove it, all right? But I do suspect that uh, that ended up being far more damaging to the course of human history than people realize. So I remember reading, it was a little snippet, caught my attention at the time, and I write a lot about these sorts of things at Peak Prosperity for, for my subscribers and followers. But at the time, I, I have a very good memory for this stuff. It's like almost, you know, I, I'm, I, I have a really clear memory for certain things. So I remember reading this thing that said that Alan Greenspan, in the context of that war you're talking about, the second Gulf War, had visited the White House more in a six-month window than yeah. all the prior Fed chairmen combined, right? And then last year, I tried to find those sets of articles again, and they got memory hold. They were very difficult to find. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, you know, it's funny, I, I do remember that, too. No, I, I think you're exactly. I remember that at that time. I, I mean, I was in I was in college. I was one of the you know few guys in college saying, like, you know, this is this is insane. Right. Uh, and I was saying that because I also understand the culture. I'm Egyptian. Right. And it's like, you know, yeah, it's well, a whole nother talking about. Right. Well, I mean, what I mean, why, why is the Fed chairman going to the White House? In the context of the war, right? Yeah. right. I thought there were well, two separate entities. Yeah, correct. 
Right. And then, but, but that's interesting. So that's why my ears perked up when you said that's where you can sort of like say that laid the groundwork. You know, it's just a new policy. Camel's nose under the tent. Hey, now we, this is what we do. Right. And so that was the war. I think we decided to spend, to have a tax cut and a war, you know, anyway. So how do you pay for that? Right. right exactly. Right? You pay for it with inflation. I mean, with, with embedded and that's the thing, it's like, okay, so we had this period of disinflation and QE, it really resulted in inflation and in asset markets. Mm-hmm. Right. And now it's like all spilled over into the real economy. It's more than just COVID. Like to think that this is purely because of COVID alone to me is silly. Right. right? COVID would obviously put it over the edge in terms of inflation. But think about what was the impact of zero interest rate policy. It resulted in more leverage buyouts taking out competitors. So increasingly, the effect of what's happened in the last you know two decades is concentration in pretty much every single industry. Everything's like an oligopoly now. Okay, so I'm pretty sure competition solves inflation. Where's the competition when every one of these big companies could finance at basically no rates uh, buyouts of their competitors? WeWork did that. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, so it's you know, it's like I don't know why anybody's surprised as to what we're here. I think people have to think a little bit uh, deeper than just saying all oh, this is because of COVID. No, no, this has been in the works for a while. Mm-hmm. Well, I have uh, a lot of friends who are, you know, fairly big in the commercial real estate space, multifamily, stuff like that, you know, fairly large portfolios. And there came a time, though, where they said, gosh, you know, um, you know, our cap rates have been compressed down to 3%, sometimes sub, which is an unacceptable cap rate in that business. And but they were up against people whose cap rates were different than theirs because they were getting their cost of capital was a full point lower or even more because they had access to that to that money spigot, right? So your Blackstones, your Black Rocks, et cetera, you know. So in that really distorted markets, fast forward, and now people are like, why are rents so high in Atlanta? There's a whole story here to, to, to unravel, isn't there? Yeah, and, and, it, and it goes back to, uh, it's a lot more uh, complex than what the headlines would have you suggest. But in a lot of ways, that complexity does start off with a very simple concept, right? Policymakers want more power. Policymakers mm-hmm. get voted in not by austerity, but by stimulus. Correct. Yep. Voters vote based on nominal, not based on real. Right. So all this ultimately creates significant distortions in a system. And I'll tell you something. It's um, let's take it back to the path point. I'm not a perma bear. I'm not a perma bull by any means. Anybody that's followed me for the last you know 15 years writing for Marco Watch, I used to write for Barry Riddles, uh, for Mark Faber, for other people that are known to be bullish and bearish. Right. The, the frustration for me as a portfolio manager, right, of these three funds as an entrepreneur, is that it created distortions in terms of the co-movements of historical market behavior, because the economy of today is very different than the economy of 20 years ago, not because things have fundamentally changed, but because of monetary distortion being as severe as it is, right? So I launched my mutual fund the day before QE3, emerging market small caps. I launched my ETFs, Roro and Jojo, right before the greatest collapse in treasuries in history, where the risk offside miserably fails, which now I hope turns around. But it's like, this has been a really difficult environment for people to manage through that path point because of the distortions that have been in the ground for a long time that are now starting to really bloom in a really aggressive way. I'll tell you one of the areas I got completely wrong, uh, you know, checking I think it was just yesterday or today I saw that that house prices again in many key markets are hitting new highs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I was a year ago I was telling people beware of the fall because you know 7% mortgages are going to crush that story. Yeah. Not yet. Um would you assign that to the same distortion process? So I was with you and I was very colorful in, in describing lumber's price behavior and what it meant for housing because the average home has 16,000 board feet of lumber and I've been wrong on that clearly but I do think it's another one of those interesting dynamics where it's about the sequence. Okay, so markets have risen. There's been a slight reacceleration in housing despite mortgage rates being elevated. Well, maybe there's a wealth effect that's causing housing to go higher because your investment portfolio is going up because you're an NVIDIA and NVIDIA is going up forever. And that means I can take on that 7% mortgage. Oh, and by the way, I, there's always a chance I can refinance it at a lower rate. So it keeps mm-hmm. the demand there, right? Now, that doesn't mean that you and I are wrong. Just because there's been a reacceleration and housing prices are picking up doesn't mean it's outpacing inflation. This is the other thing, too. It's like housing has not been an inflation hedge the last year. Real estate has not been an inflation hedge the last year. Right. So 
And it could and housing, as you know, is a, is a long cycle. It can take time for that to play out. The inventory issue, I think, is an interesting one to think about when it comes to housing. I, I've long held this idea that you solve the inventory problem, the supply problem with housing, very simplistically, with fear. And what's happened, and this goes back to zero interest rate policy and distortions. What's happened over the last you know decade plus is more and more people ended up being uh, landlords to rent out through things like Airbnb, buying up second, third, fourth properties and re-leveraging each one of those properties, turning what is supposed to be what you just live your life in into an income producing asset, right? And for the masses, democratization. I've seen some interesting studies that show that, you know, the estimate is you need to have 3 million homes built to solve the inventory shortage, but there's 10 million second homes. So is it really an inventory issue or is it a concentration issue? Now, if I'm right that you have a credit event, if the recession is still coming, which, by the way, is not me saying that, that's the yield curve saying that, that creates fear. That creates an unloading of some of those properties against mortgage rates that are still very, very elevated. So the day of reckoning for housing, I think, is still coming. It got postponed a bit. But that doesn't mean that it was wrong. A lot of people, you know, going back to the, the, the 2006 example, you know, in shorting housing back then, housing peaked in 2006. It didn't matter until, you know, three years later. So mm-hmm. this stuff can take time. Now, I'm a huge skeptic of um, government statistics and none more so than the CPI. And I, I've got a very deep detangling of that. You know, they're this, the tricks they play with hedonics, weighting, substitution, all of that. Um, you know, for instance, they weight the the healthcare component of the CPI at about 4.8% um, when it's 20% of the economy. And so if that 4.8% is rising fast, but it's only 4.8 instead of 20, right? It, you know, it's just a game they play. But my own personal experience, I was actually shocked at the store, shocked the other day, posted that on Twitter. I was like, 258 bucks and we didn't even make it to the first rung of, you know, bottom of the cart, right? Because right. everything's a $10 bill now. You get put 25 items in there and it's 20, 250 bucks, right? So your your thoughts on inflation, where are we really at? You know, it is it is it really moderating as much as they say? Where do you see it going? Well, no, I, mean, I, I, I tend to, I'm not of the same mindset of sort of the conspiratorial, it's like 20%, right? Mindset. But yeah, inflation is obviously higher than than what we're seeing. And you're right, it's a question of waiting. By the way, it's also a question of zip code, right? Like, <laughs> I'm in New York. Inflation in New York is way higher than anywhere else in the country, probably, other than San Francisco, you can argue, right? And even that's debatable. Um, so I do think, like, these nuances have to be factored in. But it goes back to this nominal versus real discussion. Okay, so one of the arguments people make is, as it relates to markets now is that, okay, we're going to break the new highs, the, the highs from November of 2021, and that means we're in a new bull market for sure. Okay, except that the after inflation adjusted high for the S&P is like 15% more than the mm. nominal level. And I keep going back to, you don't know perspective wise if you're in a bull or bear market, except with hindsight. And in the case of a bull market, if you've taken out the prior inflation adjusted high. So you still have a lot of room for, you know, uh, to, to still be proven right that the bear market's still there. But the 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 inflation point is, is I ha- I personally think that there's, if you have a credit event, that's going to be one way to break inflation substantially, right? You have to cause unemployment to go up, which by the way, you cause unemployment to go up, that fixes also, goes back to the fear discussion around housing, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, you get default risk, repricing, credit event, fear, scare, unemployment goes up. I, I think there is an argument to be made that sequencing wise, you could have a period of outright deflation before another reacceleration of inflation. And I say that because if you're going to ultimately go back, which we can debate to a 2% long run inflation rate, people forget you don't get to a long run inflation rate of 2% by just stopping at 2%, right? Mean reversion means you have to go past the mean, which means you probably have to have from a cycle perspective, a period of what looks like outright deflation, like, by the way, what China's going through, right? I don't think anybody's prepared for that also. I mean, it's. I think it's very questionable to say what's the lesser of two evils, right? Inflation is terrible, but mm-hmm. deflation, I'd argue, is horrendous when your starting point for the deflation is excessive leverage like we have now. So we all know it's a very nasty combination, 
we don't know when it ends or how it plays out, but we know we should at least be aware of it because that's what determines how to position our portfolio. Well, I, I personally, <clears throat> I would enjoy it if if the Fed would stop enabling all of this fiscal spending um, yes. nastiness because because that's that is a giant problem um, going forward. But back to inflation, though. So so you know, my own personal anecdote. Um, that to me is just sort of you know an, an annoying moment, but but that's because I'm a fortunate human being in in terms of you know how I my my income in this world. Sure. For other people, you know, in my county, I live in a very poor county where where the median household income is you know close to fifty thousand. I look at that, I'm like, this is this is unsustainable. So yeah. there comes a moment when inflation goes into that the expectations become unanchored, where where people's behaviors begin to change. Okay, so if consumer behavior changes and consumers are going to face a $1.6 trillion um, student loan bill that's coming due in October. They've got $12 trillion of mortgage debt. That's a new all-time high you know, around there. We've got credit card debt now over a trillion. We've got auto loans of $1.6 trillion. That's a lot of trillions. It, it, isn't the danger here that the Fed, you know, that, that somehow consumer behavior snaps, you know, does that phase change? Goes no, in a new I, direction? I, I think you're 100 right. There's, and it's kind of like, um, I keep using that line, slowly then all of a sudden. So- yeah. It takes time for habits to change. Spending is a habit, right? So credit card rates have been surging, right? They're in new highs, right? Uh, credit card uh, balances are at new highs, the trillion dollar mark. Okay, so consumers don't seem to know or care about what's happening for their revolving credit, but they start to realize it over time when suddenly their minimum payments keep going up and up and up. So it's only a matter of time until suddenly the consumer on average starts to say, you know what, we got to change our habits, change our spending. And then to your point about the student loan dynamic, yeah, that's going to suck out cash flow from the system. But there's a, there's a bigger, I'd argue there's more of an existential problem, though, with society here, which is that when people are desperate, when inflation's outpacing everything else, and they just go towards forms of escapism, because the real world sucks in mm -hmm. the way that they're operating, people then forget how to interact with other people. I'd argue that actually creates, you know, uh, the Fed, I've, I've used that line before, it has enabled the worst in humanity to come out, right? Because when you're desperate, now you're in fight or flight mode, which means you probably are going to be more aggressive and more negative towards people, both in real life and online, especially. So there is this other dynamic, I think, which is unfortunate that you can argue the fabric of society is also getting torn apart because of easy monetary policy which results in all this inflation, which results in people starting to blame each other when they have to simply look at themselves as voters. And instead of saying, I'm going to vote for the guy that's going to give me more, maybe we should actually vote for the one that actually does the right thing. I, I love that you've put it this way. I, my framing for this, I call this rats in a cage. And, and the metaphor is that when you have a rat in a cage and you, you give it no escape and you put a shock right. through the floor, it'll sit there and be miserable. But when you put a second rat in, they see they get they get to point at the other rat and go, OK, I'm miserable. It must be you. And they start to fight when, in fact, it's the person outside in the white coat delivering the shocks. The right. monetary policy, those have been the shocks. And it is shocking. And I wish people could understand that because we shouldn't be fighting each other. We should be making making the noise at, at the dude in the white coat pressing the button. Right. Right. Um, to me, money isn't a real thing. It's a social agreement. Right. It, it would be real if we tied it to something tangible that was fixed in, in volume. Right. A Bitcoin, a gold. I don't care. Right. But but for now. That's the social glue. It's our contract. That's how I know to trust you, even though I don't know you. We exchange hundred dollar bills for something. Right. When you shred that social contract, you get Venezuela, you get Zimbabwe, you get Weimar, you get you get negative outcomes. And I never hear the Fed talk about that. They got their tailor rules and their full employment and their fictitious dual mandates and all this and that. But in fact, they're monkeying with our social fabric, with their policies. And, and they and, took a, right, they no, took right, a generation right. and threw right. it under a bus. They said, sorry, millennials, it's important to us that boomers' houses don't go down in price because we need them to keep spending. So you can't form households. Right? Right. That's, that's not good. No, it's also not good that um, the most powerful man in the world that sets monetary policy, which impacts the poor middle class the most, is worth like $30, $40 million. Right. Like you have to start questioning a little bit incentives also. You know, it, it, I, I loved, uh, I think it was Warren Buffett back in the day, but he had a list of things he would do to reform government. It was basically just have them live by their own rules, right? Right. 
you know, they, they have to buy healthcare on the open market. They would have to, you know, et cetera. Right. Um, and so I do believe that that Warren Buffett's right hand man, Charlie Munger, said, you show me the incentive. I'll right. show you the outcome. Exactly. Right. right? Yeah, that's exactly. So, right. and, and that's and that is that is so it is so unfortunate that people don't think in those terms. And I get it. They don't think in those terms that they're too busy living day to day. They don't quite see the connection between mm-hmm. you know the elites and themselves. But everything that's being done that affects us longer term is ultimately being done by people that are, have their own self-interest at heart. By the way, that's not irrational. We're all self-interested. You know, we're human beings, right? We're all focused on that, including the policymakers. But it's like, at, at some point, you have to start saying enough. Now, um, I'd love to get your perspective on this because because I told people at the time, keep a journal. This is amazing. So watching the Fed expand its balance sheet from, I'll just use very round numbers, from $4 trillion to $8 trillion because COVID. Right. Um, I didn't I, I, I don't have I, don't, I didn't know how to put that into words. Like, how do we how do you explain to people what actually happened there? Because that you want to talk distortions you, like that's an experiment. You try it and then you have to sort of, as you say, years later, look back and go, what happened? <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, the look, I mean, it's easy to, to say with hindsight, here's what they should have done or not done. Right. Mm-hmm. But. um you had, why did the system? Why did they have to step in with trillions of dollars? Because you had no trillions. Of, because you had no trillions of dollars to use. There was no surplus on the fiscal side. So it's like, what really accentuated all this? Was it the trillions of dollars that they put into the system, or was it the fact that there was no 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 rainy day uh, uh, to 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 save the system with on the fiscal side? Right, rainy day fund. My argument. Right. So. That's what I'm saying. It wasn't just the the single cause. It was the added fuel to the fire. But, you know, had the government entered COVID with a, 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 a surplus and you had a much better fiscal situation than we had entering COVID, I doubt we will be in the place we're in now. Mm-hmm. Well, I agree. And and um, you know, obviously, we've got some some big things coming up for, you know. Speaking of which, so we're coming into another election cycle, presidential election cycle. And so sometimes you see some of these issues get trotted out. So the debt levels has gotten a little bit of airtime. But remember back in the day, um, we talked about the lockbox, Social Security. Yeah, yeah. So I'd love to get your perspective on this. Congressional Budget Office drops a bomb December 22 of 22 and says, hey, oh, yeah, this thing we call the Social Security and its trust fund. I'm you're holding up air quotes to anybody just listening because there is no trust fund. There's IOUs from the Treasury, which is. Enron style subdivision accounting tricks, right? But at any rate, even those pile of special IOU treasuries are going to run out completely by 2033, which as far as I'm concerned, is almost no time whatsoever. This is huge. Obviously, we're either going to have to cut benefits enormously or raise the FICA taxes enormously. And by their own estimates at the time, it was going from roughly 12%, what is it, 12.6, to 17.9, just to square that up. Um, what did you, what did you make of that? I thought it was big news, but it got almost no coverage. <laughs> yeah. Well, it doesn't get coverage because it's too far out in time. And, you know, the media wants to focus on, you know, uh, the here now, not the, the long term, which is almost unresolvable. Right. I mean, it's, it's 10 not, years. It's, yeah. It's even, it's, it's, it's even beyond that. I mean, is, you can, you can, uh, I know you've done work on the pension time bomb. That's also out there too. Right. Broadly speaking. So, yep. um, eh. it's hard for people to get their minds around the very long term, right? It's like most people are just trying to survive. So on the one hand, you can't blame them or the media for covering it because the media is only going to give the people what they want and people don't want to think about what's happening 10 years from now. They want to think about what's happening now or tomorrow. But having said that, uh, (laughs) I'd argue that's going to be nominally bullish because there's only one answer, print. Nominally bullish, not real bullish. Nominally, nominally. Right, and that's that's why I keep going. It's like when... uh, uh, I was on Fox when the um, when the balloons were were getting the headlines, and it's like, oh, is it aliens or not? Right, and the the Chinese uh, balloons. And I was on Fox, and I said, you know, I'll bet you if it's aliens, it's very bullish because it means they're going to have to restart QE. Right, so it's like all roads still go to more money printing. Right, right? all roads go to more longer term inflation, even though you're going to be interrupted by shorter term disinflation, deflation shocks, credit events. 
Uh, and all that means is that, as I keep saying colorfully on, on Twitter slash X, we're all in a lot of trouble. The best we can do is manage through it. So how do we manage through that? What, what advice are you giving people? I think the biggest uh, piece of advice is be skeptical. Be skeptical of narratives. I mean, this is sort of my main raison d'etre. Like, I don't believe mainstream narratives. I have I have an allergy towards narratives that follow price. I think it means you have to have assets that can perform in pretty much all environments, at least have a high probability of doing so. It means don't have too, too much conviction and control what you can control. So what can we control? We can control our expenses for the most part, right? Yeah, you might have to move to another state. Yeah, you might have to downgrade from some brand name to something else, but control what you can control. And I always, always go back to it. it's like the real store of value is skill, right? I mean, hmm. be your own backup, right? Don't look for somebody else to help you. Don't look for the handout. Be the person that can fight. Because at the end of the day, it is going to be all, all uh, we're all out for ourselves, right? So yeah, I, I, I know that's not really sort of very actionable, but I think it's more of a mindset. And I think that's really important, especially in a world where, like I said, we've abdicated so much personal responsibility to big daddy government. Um, yeah. The, the contrarian it says, don't be like that. I agree completely. And this is my raison d'etre as well, which is I, I want people to achieve financial freedom. I want people to be resilient. And of course, resilience has many components to me. It's not food in the basement. It's the skills you have. It's uh, it's your emotional skill, your EQ, very important. Can you keep a level head when everybody else seems to be falling apart? It's it's um, it's maybe even growing a little of your own food. It's you know it's controlling your expenses, all of that. Because in an uncertain world, you control what you can. I can't do anything about Fed printing. I can carp about it, and I do. Right. But I can buy gold. Um, I can buy what I consider to be non-correlated or inversely correlated, you know, inflation assets, uh, and hope for the best. Right. But I got to be diversified because I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> the older I get, the less I know for sure. You know. <laughs> yeah. No. And, and the 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 uh, the older you get, the more you realize that um, nobody knows what tomorrow brings. There's that great Oscar Wilde quote: "I'm not young enough to know everything." <laughs> yeah. And I I think unfortunately, especially with these again the uneducated speculators because of you know the new entrants that are just looking at these data points and getting fooled by the randomness of the market as skill versus luck. Uh, you've got to be very humble in terms of. Mm how you perceive things because the world is so much more complex and there's so much many more moving parts than uh, what is happening based on Powell's words of the moment. Great. Well, as we wrap up here, Michael, how do people follow you and all your incredibly great work and um, how should they uh, communicate with you? Yeah, no, I appreciate that. It's um, at Lee Lag Report on X, Instagram, YouTube, all that good stuff. Uh, I, I had an interview with you not too long ago that was hosted on the YouTube channel, the podcast, Lead Life Live. I also, you know, have skin in the game, an entrepreneur. I've got these funds that are rules-based. Um, they have not done that well, but there are no gurus, only cycles. I'm hoping that the cycle comes the way of risk on, risk off again, following what failed miserably last year with bonds being down more than stocks and the interaction of treasuries failing against equity volatility. Uh, but the broader point remains... I'm accessible as much as I can. I try to, like you, I try to provide a different perspective. And I think that's really important. It's like for all the yelling and screaming about uh, what's going on in the world, again, go, I go back to nobody knows the future, so don't fall for confirmation bias. Seek out Indeed. those that have different perspectives, even if they're wrong, because at least it might get you to think differently. Mm -hmm. I often know that somebody's running against uh, my preferred system because I get a, I get a little um, agitated. And that's like, oh, now I got to listen, right? Yeah. Yeah, wait, the moment the moment you're agitated, you should pay the most attention and not exactly. insult and not insult. Right. You should actually be absorbing it. No, no. That agitation, that's for me to manage. That's part of my right. my EQ. Right. right. Um, but but that is my sign that I have a belief system in play that needs challenging. That's right. Yeah. So, hey, thank you very much. Also, you can find Michael at leadlagreport.substack.com. And uh, he's got a great output there as well. So thank you so much for your time here today and really appreciate it. I hope we can do it again soon. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Thank you.